All right. Work hard, play hard. It's a slogan that many of us and probably many of you in the audience live by each day. Can I get a show of hands of who feels that this somewhat reflects their lifestyle? I was afraid of that. I believe we can do better than that. I do. And tonight I'm going to explain to you why your new slogan should evolve to be work hard, play hard, and sleep hard. <laughs> so a little bit more about me. I studied the effects of sleep on our brain and on performance for close to 10 years. I started at the Netherlands Institute of Neuroscience, then went on to Harvard, and finally did my PhD at UC Berkeley. And in the last two and a half years, I've been giving workshops and talks on the importance of sleep for business consultants, doctors, scientists, and other clients. And I've made it my personal mission to create a more effective, a healthier, and a happier world by promoting sleep. And tonight I'll share some of this material with you. Let's just kind of think back though, because this work hard, play hard world didn't always exist. When my grandparents were in their 30s, they had a very different life. They would go to work, come home, cook, hang out with their friends and family, maybe read a book by themselves. But that was about all the entertainment there was. And this sounds a little boring to our 21st century overstimulated brains. But that's the way it was. There were no WhatsApps or text messages coming in on your iPhone, and no disturbing, stressful emails coming in on your laptop in the evening. That was it. And how different is it today? We have all these digital gadgets that provide entertainment 24-7. And we usually even take them into our bedroom. And then who wants to sleep when you can send your friends messages or read the news or watch funny cat movies? <laughs> but these nights filled with entertainment can lead to some rough mornings. I think we've all been there pouring your orange juice in your cereal bowl or forgetting to put the milk back in the fridge. And it's not just us. There's a survey being done in the US that already started back in the 1940s. And it asked people how much they sleep. You can see it started off with about eight hours. And it dropped down to only actually less than seven hours a night. And that one hour might not sound like such a big difference, but it starts to add up after a year. Basically, after one year, you've racked up 45 nights of eight hours of sleep that you've now missed in this year. And what's even more disturbing is the percentage of people say that they sleep six hours or less. It's gone up dramatically from 11% to 40. But why are we not sleeping enough? What's so hard about it? I'm convinced that most people don't sleep enough because they don't realize the effects on their brain. So tonight I'll share with you the wonders taking place while we're drifting off each night and hopefully convince you that sleep should actually be back on top of your priority list. <laughs> Don't worry, it doesn't involve throwing away your precious smartphone or telling your boss that you're not going to check your emails after 5 p.m. Now what I'm going to talk to you about is three big benefits of sleep. Firstly, sleep cleans your brain. Secondly, it improves your memory. And finally, it makes you smarter and better at decision making. Sounds pretty good, right? Well, by sleeping. <laughs> Let's start with the first one. This is probably actually the big reason why we sleep in the first place, or perhaps why it ever evolved. Now, when you're thinking during the day, your brain cells or your neurons produce toxic byproducts which is very similar to what your muscles do when you work out. And we used to think that the brain simply recycles these toxins, but it turns out that that costs too much energy. So it has to come up with something different. And the space in between your neurons, your brain cells, is actually mainly dedicated to removing this waste at night. And what it does, it, it kind of um, swells up, and it allows the fluids to flow through your brain more freely. Basically, it's cleaning and flushing your brain. And this happens mostly during sleep. Therefore, sleep results in a clean brain. 
ready for work or fun or other things. What's also interesting is that these new findings are the first explanation between something that sleep scientists already knew. And that's that if you don't sleep on a suffi like sufficiently on a normal basis, you have an increased chance of developing Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, but we never knew why. And this explains why, because in these diseases, you see that that brain waste starts to stick together like gum, and it prevents their neurons from functioning and basically kills the neurons. Now we know sleep cleans up that very same waste before it can turn into gum later on, probably preventing or helping decrease the chances of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. But it's not just for cleaning, it's also for memory. But when I talk about memory, I'm really talking about three different memory stages. The first one is encoding, which is what hopefully you guys are all doing right now. You're taking in new information. And then secondly, you want to consolidate. You want to make sure that it's going to stick in your memory. And then finally, let's say your friend asked you next week what this talk was about. I hope you're going to retrieve it from memory. There's not just different memory stages, there's also different memory types. One is declarative memory, for instance, words. So maybe your French that you learned in high school. A second one is episodic memory. So say your Christmas Eve 10 years ago. And another one is procedural memory. It's your memory of how you do things. So how you hit a tennis ball or how you drive your car. And this type of procedural memory is what they tested in some of the first sleep studies. And what they did is kind of a piano task where a participant sits behind a keyboard and has to learn to type in a certain sequence. In this case, that's three, two, four, one, three. I know, we're not the creative sleep researchers. <laughs> now, what the participants have to do is they type the sequence over and over again in these 30 seconds. And then they get some rest because your fingers get tired. Now, training is 12 of these trials, and then your retest is three. They had two groups in this experiment to test what's the effect of sleep on consolidation of such a piano task. Now, the wake first group, as the name already says, starts off with the training in the morning and is then awake for 12 hours. Then they get retested in the evening, and then they get to sleep in the lab and have another retest the next morning. Now, you always want a control group, so there's also a sleep first group. As the name says, they train in the evening and then sleep first, have their retest, and then their second retest after a normal day of work. So let's look at the results. I'm going to start with the wake first group, and I'm going to show you these results in the number of correct sequences per trial. So the group started off in the morning, and this is their score from their training. And then they get retested in the evening. Now you see a little bit of an increase in performance. They got more practice, they got a little better, but not statistically significantly better. But then they get a night of sleep, and performance jumps up by almost 20%. Imagine becoming 20% better at tennis, just by sleeping. <laughs> now, some skeptics in the audience might say, I don't think it's sleep. You know, maybe consolidation just takes 24 hours, no matter what I do, whether I'm awake or whether I'm asleep. That's why we have the sleep first group. Now, as I said, the sleep first group started their training in the evening, and then got to sleep immediately after. They also improve 20%, and they keep that improvement during the day. And there were other control groups to make sure that this isn't because of attentional differences, it's not because of time of day differences, uh, or muscle fatigue, or things like that. Now that sounds nice, but that's in a lab, right? Does that hold outside of a lab? What if I want to become an expert violinist? I don't think I actually have the talent, but what if I would? Would sleep help? So three researchers tried to answer this question. They went to an historic arts university in West Berlin, and they asked their professors, select a group of standout violinists, the ones that would really go on to be professional performers. And then, we'll call them the elite students, that's about right. 
And then as a control group, select students from the music department, the teaching department, that are going to go out to become teachers. But mind you, these are also very serious about playing the violin. The only difference is that their performance, the result, isn't quite in the same league as these elite students. Now what they did, they gave both groups um, diaries to keep track of what they were doing. So when are you practicing? How are you practicing? When are you sleeping? Keep track of everything. To answer the question, what makes you such an elite performer versus good, but not in the same league? And what's interesting is that the first thing they found is that the elite students don't actually spend more time practicing. Both groups spend about 50 hours a week. So that's not it. But it's the type of practice that was different between the two groups. What they found was that the expert performers did more of what they called deliberate practice. What's deliberate practice? It's practice where you really, really focus and you stress your skills. It's uncomfortable, but you try really hard. And that's what the elite students did much more of than the teachers, who were just, I guess, mocking around a little bit more on the violin. The second difference is when they practice. So you see that the elite students have a consolidated block of practice in the morning, then they take a break, and then they have another consolidated block of practice. Whereas the teachers don't really have such clear breaks. They kind of practice throughout the day. That wasn't the only difference between the two groups. The other difference was, ta-da, of course, sleep. <coughs> two things. The first one is that the elite players slept a little bit longer than the teachers, a little bit more than half an hour. But again, it adds up after a year. Second difference is when they sleep. Now, as you can imagine, most people sleep during the night. Elite students do too. But you can see it here, but they also reliably take a nap in the afternoon. <laughs> I know, it sounds really good. Um, they take this nap right in that break that you saw in the previous slide. So they practice, take a nap, practice some more. And the teachers don't do that. So this tells you, to become that expert performer, you need both deliberate practice and sleep. But what could be the mechanism behind that? What's so magical about sleep that it helps your memory. A famous study by Matt Wilson at MIT tried to answer this question. Matt and his poor rats had to run through these mazes. It's a navigation task, it's a memory task. We have to figure out you know, what's the course of this maze. And they were hooked up to these electrodes, which make sure that you can track the activity from individual electrodes and they'll make a popping sound when they're active. Now one night, he forgot to unhook them. So the rats were done running through the mazes, and they were actually falling asleep. And this researcher was sitting behind his lab and started to hear that popping sound again. And it was the same patterns that he heard during the day when they were running through the maze. And it turns out that there was this replay in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is a memory structure that helps move your memory from short term memory over to long-term memory. So you see there's replay during sleep that's helping consolidation. Basically, during sleep, the brain is reinforcing all these skills that you've learned. However, it's even smarter than that. Which brings me to the last point, insight and decision-making. <coughs> We've all noticed that sometimes you sleep and you just wake up with such a, maybe not brilliant idea, but good idea. And actually, many inventors and musicians say that they came up with their brilliant idea in sleep or in a dream. In fact, Paul McCartney came up with the tube for yesterday in his sleep. Now, that's great, these anecdotes, but it's not quite scientific proof. Then we have science. A group of researchers really tried to figure out what, what about sleep gives you this insight? And can we recreate this in a lab? Now, they give these poor participants quite an annoying math task. Um, so let's see what you think about this. You get a string of numbers, 
and now you have to make the second string of numbers. I'll explain how to do this, don't worry. The end goal, though, is to find that final number. That's all you need to do. Then you can go on to your next string of numbers. So here are the rules. Firstly, this task only contains ones, nines, and fours. OK, so what you're going to do is you want to try to figure out this little question mark there. What you do is you compare the number to the left of it with the number above. Now there's just two rules. If these two numbers are the same, then you're going to write down that very same number, which in this case is the case, so 1 and 1 turns into 1. But if the two digits are different, then you pick that third di digit. So only 1, 9, and 4, so it's quite easy. Now, I won't make you do this whole thing. Um, I already did it for you. You can check it if you want. But what I will do is ask you to put yourself in the shoes of the participants who are going through all of these tasks numbers by numbers. And they weren't told that there was a hidden rule. There's a way to do this much quicker. So have a look and see if you can find the hidden rule. I see some puzzled faces, so let me just help you out here. So the goal is to get to this final number, number nine. It turns out that the last six digits are a mirror image, which means that if you figure out that first nine, you're done. It's always the same as the last one. Now, don't worry, I didn't find this myself either. <laughs> Um, it's probably needless to say that these are German researchers coming up with this task. <laughs> but once participants figured out this hidden rule, the time it takes to finish one line drops from nine seconds down to three seconds. So it's a lot faster. Of course, the big question is, does sleep help you with this? Such a hidden rule, such insight, does sleep help you figure it out? Now, of the group that stayed awake after doing this task, about a quarter of them figured out the rule. Don't worry, I know it's not a quarter here, but if you do this 200 times, I'm sure you guys will also have figured it out. But what happens after a group sleeps? 60% of them discover this hidden rule after sleep. And that makes sense. How often are you working on this tough problem in the evening and you just can't figure it out? So you go to sleep, you wake up, in the morning you look at your tough problem and it's so much more simple the next morning. All you did was sleep on it. Now Daniel Schechter is a great memory researcher at Harvard and he said that memory is actually not to remember the past. Memory is to predict the future. Now one of these prediction tasks that they use in sleep research is called the weather prediction task. <coughs> Participants get these four different cards, and they're being asked, does this card predict rainy weather, or does it predict sunny weather? <laughs> now, obviously the first time you have no idea, but after a while, people start to get the hang of it. It's a probabilistic task, meaning that one card, let's say 80% of the time predicts rainy weather, or maybe 40%. <coughs> After about 200 trials, people are about 75% accuracy. If you test them in the morning and then test them in the evening, they're still at about 75% accuracy. However, if you let them sleep on it, performance jumps by 10%. So that again shows that sleep isn't simply consolidating what you did during the day, it's also doing that. But it's doing much more than that. It's creating a better mental model of how the world works and it helps you make better decisions. Which makes you wonder about all these <laughs> important decision makers, CEOs, politicians, that make very critical decisions with a very big impact, and that usually don't actually get a lot of sleep. And those decisions are very similar to the weather prediction task in being uncertain, unpredictable, actually much more complex than a weather prediction task. In fact, Bill Clinton was quoted saying, every important mistake I've made in my life, I made because I was too tired. 
I think there were some uh, key moments that I think Bill should have just taken a nap. <laughs> now it's not just impeachment or divorce um, that you're risking when you're not sleeping enough. There's actually much more serious consequences. So just the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger in 86, and also the nuclear disaster in Chernobyl. In both situations, the people responsible for the operations and making decisions were working under extreme sleep deprivation. It's not just in cases of extreme, extreme sleep deprivation that we're making these mistakes. Actually, in our sleep-deprived society, this happens a lot. In fact, one in five car accidents is due to sleep deprivation, people falling asleep. And unfortunately, these causes are much more fatal than other causes of car accidents. Hopefully by now, you are convinced of the critical importance of sleep. Now, they only gave me 20 minutes, so I didn't even have time to go in all the other benefits of sleep such as helping with your mood, or helping prevent a heart attack, stroke, weight gain, or helping you with your skin, your looks, empathy. So please join me in living by and spreading the slogan of work hard, play hard, and sleep hard. Thank you.